Now you may not be finished yet, but let's go ahead and pray. Father, I thank you so very much for this opportunity to study your word, to study the unveiling of Jesus Christ. I thank you for every woman in this room. I thank you, Lord, that they made the effort to come back even in the midst of confusion last week. We know who the author of confusion is. And so this morning, Lord, in the name of Jesus, we cast out the spirit of confusion from this room. The enemy is not welcome here in this room. And Father, we pray for a legion of angels to surround us this morning and protect this room as we focus on your word so that we don't have to do warfare while we're trying to focus on you, Father. We pray in the, in the heavenly realm that the warfare that's going on, Lord, that you will send your angels to surround this room and to keep out any dark forces that would um, try to attack us, distract us, deceive us, or confuse us in the name of Jesus. Father, I pray for every need that's represented here. I know that there are some who need healing. Some are dealing with cancer. Some are dealing with grief and sorrow. Some are just completely stressed and, and overwhelmed by anxiety. Some are praying for prodigal sons and daughters to come home. Some are praying for family members to be saved. Lord, you know the need of each woman in this room. And I pray that you would bless their time here, that you would increase their time when they leave so that they can make up for the time that they're devoted to be in your word. Most of all, Father, we pray that your Holy Spirit would be present to be our teacher this morning, that the Holy Spirit would speak through me so that I only present truth in a clear and precise manner. And that, Father, you give us ears to hear the message of Revelation. Help us understand it, Lord. With everything within us, we want to understand it and not be confused by it. So we give this time to you, Lord Jesus. And thank you that you are the Savior of the world and that you are the Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the end, the first and the last. And you are our coming King. Amen. Amen. Okay, so... If you left here last week very confused, so did I. <laughs> Just to, to tell you, I could see the, you know, the um, feedback in your faces from last week. It was completely different from the summer study, if you were here in the summer. Um, there was a lot of warfare going on last Wednesday, and I thought it was just me. I went home just feeling totally like a failure, you know, all day. It took me a while to get over it. And uh, I started sharing with my rooted group. Um, and one of the people in our group is on staff. And she said, don't you remember a few weeks ago that Rick said we would, uh, because we're going through rooted, because we've made this um, commitment to be in God's word, that the enemy is going to come against us. And I thought, oh, well, duh, you know. <laughs> we all committed to understand Revelation, and the enemy came, and he came in a major way last week, and um, I did not have my full armor of God on. I'll just have to be very honest. It didn't have, I wet heard it up. And so when an attack came before class started, I took it very personally and got flustered and, and then couldn't, you know, couldn't function uh, like I should. And that's what the enemy loves to do. And so we're not going to give him the opportunity today. He's out of here. We're going to stand our ground and say, get thee behind me, Satan. We are going to focus on the throne room of God this morning. So um, I thank you all for coming back. I do promise that today will be better. <laughs> I do promise that. So if you have your, um, you can go ahead and put your drawing away. If you're not finished, I encourage you to finish it sometime during this week because the next week when we get to chapter four we're going to do chapters two and three together next week it's the letters to the seven churches 
So we're going to combine those and do them all in one day. And then we're going to get to chapter four. When we get to chapter four, there is another throne room vision. And you are going to have to draw that. There's a place in your workbook to draw the throne room of chapter four. And you're going to have to compare that throne room to the other throne room visions in the Old Testament and to the throne room in, in uh, chapter one because the things that are added and the things that are missing are very, very significant, very important to communicate a message to us. The Holy Spirit was very methodical in the way he presented these visions, very important. So keep that drawing that you're doing and um, hang on to it, finish it this week as extra, extra homework. Let me go back to... Okay, so we're going to go through uh, this introduction very quickly on, as an overview of Revelation, the whole book. And the first thing that I want to do is to remind you about the tools that will be helpful to you as you study. If you weren't here last week, these tools are on your handout. Um, it's, I did not mention this, but it's helpful to have a three-ring binder to go along with your workbook. Some people have taken their books apart, punched holes in them, and put, them, put it in a binder, which is great. Uh, but you're going to be getting handouts every week. And to keep up with those, uh, you might want a three-ring binder with dividers for every chapter. It would be helpful, but that's only if you want to. Um, it's If you're going to mark, you need your marking pens or pencils. I suggested the micron pens because they don't bleed if you write in your Bible. There had been other pens that had been invented since I started in 1990. So if you go to Mardell's, you may find that there are other marking pens that don't bleed, that, that may even be cheaper. I don't know. The reason I don't use the colored ballpoint pens or gel pens, those, are, those will work great in your workbook. But in your Bible, they're too, they go too deep. And so you have ripples. You know, when you turn the page, you'll have ripples on your page. So those are just suggestions. And then those are the versions of the Bible that are verse by verse translations. I mentioned blueletterbible.org. One thing I forgot to mention was if you use the blueletterbible.org website on your computer, the Bible is. Um, print it out. There's a tab that says Strong's. Strong's is a concordance. If you click on that, the Strong's, every word is numbered. Every word in the Bible is numbered with a Strong's concordance number. If you click on that number, the definition of the, ori the original Greek word will pop up with the definition. And there's also a little microphone symbol and you can click on that and it will tell you how to pronounce that word. So y'all can just be super, super, super smart. <clears throat> the next thing I wanna mention is the YouTube channel. These lessons are all recorded on YouTube. So if you miss, you can go back and, and uh, watch one of those. I recorded them a few years ago when we were in lockdown. That was my project to be fruitful. And uh, so you'll have to excuse the COVID hair, COVID. <laughs> but you know, COVID. Uh, it was lockdown. So um, that's what I did with my spare time during that. So all the lessons are recorded on YouTube and then I'm also recording our discussions here. Um, I would highly recommend, if you haven't done it yet, to go to the YouTube channel and watch the introduction to Revelation. I think it's 30 minutes long. Um, but the other lessons, the chapter, verse by verse, are usually about an hour long, but the introduction is just 30 minutes. I listened to it when I walked yesterday, and I'm like, oh, I should have told them that. Oh, I should have told them. <laughs> so uh, it, I think it would be helpful. Okay, so let's talk about the, the book of Revelation, chapter 1. The very first thing we see is the revelation of Jesus. So I hear a lot of people say, oh, I love the book of Revelations. 
with an S on the end. It is one revelation, and you discovered that in your homework. There's one revelation of Jesus Christ. The whole book is one revelation. And the word revelation comes from the Greek word apocalypsis. And that sounds like apocalypse. You know, that's where we get the word apocalypse. But it's uh, apocalypsis, and it means the unveiling or the revealing. So the revelation of Jesus Christ is the unveiling of Jesus Christ. It means uh, the mystery is unfolded now. You know, it's been a mystery all this time. We have lots of messianic prophecies about the end times in the Old Testament. But when we get to the New Testament, we get more details, more details. In Matthew, uh, when Jesus was speaking in Matthew about the last days, he gave us a lot of, of details. And Jude gives us a lot of details. And First Corinthians gives us a lot of details. So we see um, that God sprinkles the message of the end times throughout the entire Bible. We have to piece it all together to get a clear message. So anyway, this is the, the single revelation of Jesus Christ. And Isaiah 4, 8 says, the volume of the book is written of me. Jesus said that of himself. The whole the Bible is about Jesus. The revelation is specific. Okay, the author of Revelation is John, um, but it came from God, and God gave it to Jesus. Jesus gave it to his angel. Angel gave it to John, and John gave it to his bond servants. Now, John is a disciple of Jesus. He was the one, he considered himself one whom Jesus loved. One whom Jesus loved. He was a favorite. He was the one of the closest to Jesus. And you remember when he was on the cross, he said, Mother, behold your son. Mm -hmm. And he, would, he asked John to take care of his mom. That's how much he loved and trusted John. Um, John, we learn in chapter 1, was banished to the island of Patmos because of the testimony of Jesus. He was old. Uh, he was old in age. He was around 80 years old when he was banished um, to Patmos. Tradition says, this is an oral tradition that says he was um, the only disciple not crucified but was submerged in hot oil and did not die. So I don't know if that's true or not. It's an oral tradition that has been passed down. And there's, at this point, you know, it's no way to prove it. But some history books include that. I think Josephus might have been one of the ones that mentioned this in Josephus' writing. He was a witness to the word of God, the testimony of Jesus, and all that he saw. We learned that in chapter 1. And, and we'll go into more depth as we read that. The recipients of the letter are his bondservants. That's us. It's written to those who call themselves believers in Jesus Christ or followers of Jesus Christ. There is a blessing for anyone who reads. We mentioned that last week, verse 3. Blessed is he who reads and those who hear the words of the prophecy and heed the things which are written in it, for the time is near. That blessing, this is the only place in Scripture where there is a blessing promised just for reading this book and paying attention to the message. Nowhere else in Scripture does that happen. Why would God put a blessing here? He wants to entice us to read it. Oh, I'll be blessed, and I'm, I'm going to read it. And even though it's confusing and we don't understand and it looks kind of scary, there's a reason he wants us to learn this. So you are blessed for committing to be here, and you're going to be blessed every day that you read Revelation. You, you know, you should read Revelation 2 and 3 every day this week uh, so that it's cemented in your mind. So you get familiar with it, and, and you're blessed every time you read it. Um, the purpose of the book was to John. John was supposed to write, therefore, the things which you have seen, the things which are, and the things which shall take place after these things. So past, present, and future, John was supposed to write it all down for our understanding. The segment divisions of the whole book of Revelation Chapter 1 is a description of the things which John saw. 
That was the vision, the throne room vision of Jesus. Chapters 2 and 3 are the things which are. That's the church age. The letters to the churches represent the church age. And then the things which will take place after these things are the things which take place after the church age. And we'll talk about the time, the time uh, segments of those as we go along. The structure and design elements of Revelation. This is very important. Um, four times John says that he was in the spirit. And there you can see all the references to when he was in the spirit. And we'll talk about that phrase, what that means. There are thunders, voices, lightnings, and an earthquake over and over and over. And you have to kind of track these as you're studying so they don't get all lumped together into one event. There, it happens over and over and over. And you'll get a timeline that shows these eventually, but I want you to do it first and then I'll pass one out and you can reconcile and make sure um, that we're all on the same, the same path. There are four doxologies in the book of Revelation. A doxology is a song, you know, the one that we sing. Praise God, come and join us. So that's a doxology. Uh, doxa means to glorify God. So a doxology is a song that glorifies God. They happen, there's, there's four different doxologies <coughs> in four different chapters, and each time one of these doxologies is sung, it builds. There's another phrase added. It starts with a small phrase and then it builds and builds and builds to this great climax um, in chapter 7. There are praises of Jesus and those are listed there. You see all the chapters that those are listed in. There are things out of place and by, what I mean by that is Daniel's prophecy said that you know, there were six things that had to happen, and those six things have not happened yet. But things out of place. Israel um, is not completely in the land. They are a nation again, and they do have Jerusalem as their um, capital. But, yes. Yes, they're on the table back here. Oh. Oh, I'm sorry. No. We're actually on page three now. Or triple one. Yeah. Okay, so there's things out of place. Israel is not completely in the land right now. There's going to be a huge regathering of Jews. It's already started. People are going back to the homeland. Uh, it will it will happen. Um it's going to finish happening when the Antichrist comes on the scene and says, hey, rebuild the temple and uh, reinitiate the sacrificial system. Then all of Israel is going to go back home um, to be a part of that. So Israel is not completely in the land yet. The church is not in heaven. That's our ultimate destination. The church will be in heaven. We're not there yet. Uh, the Lamb, the Lamb of God will have his own home. Not quite yet. He's he's not. He has a, the new heaven and new earth is his destiny. It's our destiny as well. But that's his home where he dwells and tabernacles with us. And Satan is not bound yet, is he? I think he's uh, alive and well. Yeah. So four things are out of place. Four things that have to happen according to the Book of Revelation. There are three women mentioned in Revelation. One is the wife of Yahweh. The wife of Yahweh is Israel. And all through the Old Testament, she's called the adulterous wife of God. And Hosea is a perfect analogy, but it's only, I think, three chapters, maybe four chapters. And um, the whole time, he's, he's telling this story about, uh, he's commanding Hosea to go reconcile with an adulterous wife and that goes completely against Levitical law but 
it's a picture of what God is doing for Israel. They were, he went into covenant, he entered into covenant with them um, in the day of Abraham. He selected Abraham, he entered into covenant. He said, you will be, he told Moses, you will be my, I will be your God, you will be my people. They entered into covenant. And so it's like a marriage covenant. The nation of Israel is married to God. And then they ran after false idols. And so that's why they're called the adulterous wife of God, of Yahweh. Then there is the virgin bride of Christ. So you can't say that the woman of Revelation 12 is the church because she was adulterous. And the church is the bride of Christ, and she's a virgin, a virgin bride of Christ. Two different women. And then there is a harlot, and that is Mystery Babylon. So we'll get into all those symbols, but that just gives you a little bit of a um, glimpse of what's coming. If you turn that page over, you see a list of, a partial list of sevens in Revelation. Uh, if you've studied the book of John, you know that there are a lot of sevens in the book of John. He just, that's just the way he writes. That's the way the Holy Spirit gave him the message to record. In the book of John, you're going to find, I am the bread of life. I am the light of the world. I am the salt of the earth. Um, I am he. I mean, there just are a lot of seven. I, there are seven I am statements in the book of John. He does the same thing in the book of Revelation. This whole thing is all about sevens. And that's why it's important, if you have your handouts from last week, that you have the meaning of number in scripture. Does anybody remember what seven represents? The church. Completion. Completion. So there are seven churches, seven lampstands, seven spirits, seven stars, seven title pairs. That's like Lord God, um, firstborn title pairs. There are seven promises to the overcomers. Seven seals, seven trumpets, seven eyes, seven angels, seven trumpets again. Seven thunders, seven thousands, seven heads, seven crowns, seven plagues, seven bowls, seven mountains, seven kings, seven features, seven divisions in each letter in chapters two and three, seven personages, those are characters in Revelation, seven beatitudes, blessed, those are blessed phrases, seven years of judgments, seven I am's of Christ. He uses those again in the book of Revelation, just like he did in the book of John. There are seven doxologies in heaven. That's, you know, we mentioned four earlier that build and are climactic, but in total there are seven uh, doxologies. But the four build up is, is basically one doxology that builds. And then seven new things, and that is just a partial list. There are many, 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 many more. Um, there's books written on the sevens in Revelation. That's, that's a whole study all by itself. So let's look at chapter one. Um, we already mentioned that Revelation is apocalypse or apocalypse, and it means unveiling. You can fill in your blanks. This is the fill in the blank page that says number one at the bottom. And it's in your handout. The key words in chapter one are shortly. And that word in the Greek is tacos. And it means swiftly. And you can remember that because when we eat tacos, we eat them swiftly. Right? We love tacos. So. It's not really top, it's not us, but um, the word communicated is the simeno, and simeno means uh, signs, signs. It means to express by signs. Some of your Bible translations may say that John uh, communicated it by, or was it Jesus that communicated it? Uh, he sent and communicated it by his angel to his bondservant John. So he, some of your versions say he signified it or signified it. 
he communicated it through signs. That's what that means. Uh, another key word is blessed. You're going to see blessed in verse 3. That word is makarios, and it means happy, fortunate, the highest good, well off. Happy stuff. Things to look for in Revelation are metaphors. These are words that rename a person. Then you have similes, and that the the way you know if a, a symbol is a is a simile is because it uses the word like or as. And you saw that a lot in the vision. So let me show you the metaphors. In verse 8, there's the Alpha and Omega. That's the first letter and the last letter of the Greek alphabet. It's not really the letter of the alphabet. It, it's symbolic. Verse 16, we see the seven stars and the two-edged sword. In verse 20, we see seven stars and seven lampstands. And we know that they mean something else because in verse 20 of chapter 1, he explains what those mean. similes in verse 13 he's like a son of man verse 14 his hair was like white wool like snow his eyes were like a flame of fire in verse 15 his feet were like bronze when they glowed in the fire and he had a voice like many waters and then verse 16, his face was like the sun shining in its brilliance or in its brightness. We're going to save that last page of your handouts till the very end. That's going to be our um, summary after we've gone through our discussion. So let's launch into chapter 1. And we are going to go verse by verse through chapter 1. The revelation of Jesus Christ, which God gave him to show to his bondservants the things which must soon take place. That word soon we just mentioned is tacos and it means swiftly so that doesn't mean nearness in time it means when it happens it's going to happen quickly and in quick succession once it starts it's a rolling boulder there's no stopping it once um, once those things start happening they happen rapidly and he sent and communicated it by his angel to his bondservant john who testified to the word of God and to the testimony of Jesus Christ, even to all that he saw. Remember that John was an eyewitness. He saw every, he walked with Jesus. So he saw Jesus in ministry. He saw him heal. He saw him um, preach and teach. He saw him in the temple. He saw his anger. He saw his grief. He saw everything because he was with him all the time. He saw him crucified on the cross. He saw that he was laid in the tomb and buried. He saw Jesus resurrected in the upper room. He watched Jesus ascend to heaven. He was an eyewitness to all these things, and he testified about them to all that he saw. Blessed is he who reads and those who hear the words of the prophecy and heed the things which are written in it, for the time is near. That word near does mean close at hand. The word near means close at hand. In verse 4, we see a greeting, another greeting. John, to the seven churches that are in Asia. This is Asia Minor. 
and I'll show you a map in just a minute, but he, um, this, he's writing this letter or this vision to the seven churches, and he says, grace to you and peace. Those two words are very significant because he's sending these words, uh, these letters to these seven churches, and he's saying grace to you. Now, the word grace means un unmerited favor. That means something that you don't deserve. You, it's a free gift. It's a blessing or a gift given not because you earned it, but just because of the generosity of God. So he says grace to you, and we're going to see why they need grace. Um, grace, to, grace is one of those blessings. Blessed is he who reads and hears and heeds the things written in this book. One of the blessings is grace. It, it's, a, it's a gift. And then peace. The word for peace means undisturbed. The word for peace means undisturbed. God does not want you to be disturbed about what you read in the pages of this book. He wants you to have peace in the midst of all the tribulation that's going on. Is there, excuse me, I have to ask because I'm lost again. Is there any particular place we're supposed to be right now? Um, we're reading chapter one. Okay. From the beginning. From Revelation one. Okay. No verse one. Yeah, and we're just going verse by verse through chapter one. And we are in uh, verse four now. So grace to you and peace from who? From him who is and who was and who is to come. Who is that? Jesus. Jesus. That is Jesus. So if you were marking in your Bible, you should put a red cross over him who is, who was, who is to come. And, and from the seven spirits who are before his throne. His, that his throne is God's throne. The seven spirits. You had to do some research about the seven spirits. Did anybody, did that blow anybody away? Like it blew me away the first time I read that. It's like, why? There's one Holy Spirit. How are there seven spirits? It's like there's one God, but he exists in the form of God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit has seven spirits. Complete. That's his complete personality. His complete attributes. And those were written in Isaiah. And you had to look those up. And the first one was called the Spirit of the Lord. And then there were the Spirit of Wisdom, Understanding, Counsel, Strength, Knowledge, and Fear of the Lord. So do you remember when Jesus said, I have to go away, but if I go away, I'll send you a helper, the Holy Spirit. And he will do what? He will teach you. He will guide you in all truth. All those seven things that were mentioned in Isaiah, we see Jesus repeating in the New Testament about who the Holy Spirit will be for us. And he will be our counselor. He's the one who gives us discernment to know what's true and what's not, what's good and what's evil. Um, he is our counselor. He gives us wisdom. He's our teacher. So, um, and he gives us a reverent awe of the Lord that we serve. He's the one who ushers us into the presence of God. And when we're in God's presence, we sense the Holy Spirit there so richly. We'll talk about that more in a minute. Okay, and from Jesus Christ, who was the faithful witness. Remember, he said, if you've seen the Father, you've seen me. Jesus was a faithful witness of his Father. The firstborn of the dead. Now, this is important because Jesus is known as the first fruits. So let me... I don't know if you've... Uh, studied Hades before.
There is a um, sketch of this, I think on page 267 in the back of your workbook. It's a small, little, teeny, tiny sketch at the bottom of one of the timelines. Yeah. Um, it's there. But let me explain what Hades is. Hades is called Sheol in the Bible. It's what we know as hell. This is what we consider hell. When you die, if you're an unbeliever, your soul goes to hell. Your body goes in the ground, you go to hell. Well, before Jesus was crucified, Old Testament righteous people and the people up until Jesus' death. So you have to think of that timeline. Anybody from Adam all the way to Jesus' crucifixion, if they were saved or considered righteous, when they died, their body went to the ground, their soul also went to Hades. The Hades is divided into two sections. There's a place of torment on one side, and then on the other side, there's paradise. And that paradise side was called Abraham's bosom. So when uh, there's a great gulf in between, and we know this because, do you remember the rich man? He had all great things in his earthly life, but he didn't know the Lord. And he was in torment, and he could see Lazarus on the other side in the comfort of Abraham's bosom. And Lazarus had, during his earthly life, he didn't have anything. He had leprosy. And they would put, uh, Lazarus would sit at the gate of the rich man, you know, begging for provision. And the rich man never shared. So he wanted to, he, he called out, he could communicate over this gulf but he couldn't pass over so um, he said just dip your dip your finger in water and let me have a let me have a drink and uh, Abraham said you had your good things in this life and Lazarus didn't so now Lazarus is being comforted so that's where we get the picture of Hades and the, the purpose of it but when we go a little bit further, when Jesus died, remember the prophecy of Jonah. As Jonah was in the belly of the fish or the whale for three days and three nights, so shall the Son of Man be in the belly of the earth for three days and three nights. So when Jesus died, his soul went down to Hades and he preached to the captives. He preached the gospel of who he was to the captives. Now remember, he doesn't have his new body yet. This is his soul went to Hades and preached. He's preaching the resurrection. The resurrection is real. Um, three days later, he gets his new body. He is resurrected. So his soul and his body come together. He is resurrected and he appears to many. Now, if you go to Ephesians 4, uh, let's see. Is it on there? Nope. 4, 8, thank you. Oh, okay. So, turn in your Bibles to Ephesians 4, 8. Therefore, it says, when he ascended on high, he led captive a host of captives, and he gave gifts to men. When Jesus went into Hades, he preached to the captives, and then he, he led the captives out of Abraham's bosom. And when he ascended to heaven, was it 50 days later, 40 days later, 50 days later, 40? Uh, when he ascended 40 days later, he took the captives with him. Remember there was a great earthquake when uh, the day that uh, Jesus came out of the tomb and many were resurrected and many of the people came out. There were over 500 people who were resurrected and appeared to many until the resurrection. And so uh, I believe, should I tell you what I believe? 
<laughs> so uh, by the time we get to the end of Revelation, you're going to see what happens to believers and unbelievers from Adam to eternity. You're going to see the time fragments. Right now, uh, where we are in Revelation 1, um, I just explained that Jesus emptied out Abraham's bosom and he took all of those souls with him to heaven. They don't have their new bodies yet. They have their, their soul is in heaven. Now, since Jesus ascended, when we die, we immediately go to heaven. We don't go to Abraham's bosom. That's not a waiting place for us anymore. Jesus had the keys to death and Hades, right? So that means he went to Hades, he emptied it out, and he took all those believing souls with him to heaven. So the Old Testament saints and the saints during Jesus' 33 years on earth, their souls are all in heaven. The saints then from Jesus to now, we immediately go to the Lord. Our souls are in, in heaven, immediately go to the Lord. Does that make sense? The Old Testament unbelievers all the way till now, they're all still in torment. And they will stay there until the great white throne judgment. Their bodies will be resurrected at the end of the thousand year reign. So that's, we'll get to that. <laughs> you'll see it on the timeline and, and you'll see that clearly that they get their new bodies that will never die at the second re uh, resurrection and they'll be thrown into the lake of fire because their name is not found written in the book of life. So they'll be thrown into the lake of fire in eternal torment forever and ever. I don't want to be part of that group. So let's go back to Revelation 1. And we are going to finish this today. Where are we at? Um, he was the firstborn of the dead, which means he was the first one resurrected, and the ruler of the kings of the earth. So he is sovereign over all the kings of the earth. To him who loves us and released us from our sins by his blood. Those are That's what Jesus did. So we get a description of his titles, and then we get a glimpse into what he did. He loves us, and he released us from our sins by his blood. And he has made us to be a kingdom, priests to his God and Father. To him be the glory and the dominion forever and ever. So what does it mean to be a priest to God? What, you know, if we're going to be a kingdom of priests, what are we going to be doing? What does that look like? So our example is going to the Old Testament temple. And what did the priests do in the Old Testament? Um, they offered the sacrifices for the people outside the temple. But once they went into the holy place, there was the golden lampstand, which they had to fill with oil continually so that it never burned out. And the lampstand is a picture of, uh, in the Old Testament, every part of the temple pointed to Jesus. So he is the light of the world. That's what that seven branch candle represented. The oil in the lamp represented the Holy Spirit and the seven spirits of God. Remember that because when you draw it in chapter four, you're gonna see that distinguished. Um, so the lampstand was in the holy place. Then there was a table of showbread set up and there were 12 loaves of bread on that table and the priest had to bake it and then they had to eat it. They were required to eat it every day. They had to break bread together. They had to eat the bread. Remember Jesus said, I am the bread of life. He is our daily bread. Give us this day our daily bread. The bread is the word of God. And so our light is to shine, live by the spirit. That's what that lampstand represents, us living by the spirit. The bread is studying God's word. And then there was an altar of incense. And the priest had to keep the incense burning all the time. And as it burned, they would um, put the, they would pray and put the prayers of the saints on that altar of incense. 
And as that incense burned and reached heaven, reached the nostrils of God, it was a soothing aroma to the Lord. So our prayers are a blessing to God. He loves dialogue with us. He wants to talk to us. We, you know, he, Jesus said, uh, my sheep know my voice and follow me. God created man to have relationship with him. That's what being a Christian is all about, having a personal relationship with Jesus. And how can you have a personal relationship with someone you never talked to? So he desires for us to communicate and have dialogue with him. So we do this through prayer. That's one way. Um, prayer is us doing the talking. The prayer of incense was us doing the talking. It's when we go beyond the veil into the Holy of Holies, into the presence of God, we don't have anything to say there. That's where the fear of the Lord comes in. There's nothing to do in the Holy of Holies but fall at his feet and worship him and be still and be quiet and listen. That's where we hear the voice of God and hear what he says back to us. There's, you know, what can you say to a holy God? He already knows everything about us. That's where he communicates to us. So in the holy place, though, what the priests did was they kept the lampstand functional, they baked the bread and ate the bread, and they took care of the altar of incense. They kept the incense burning before the Lord. So as we serve as priests to God uh, in, our, in our future, in our future, in our future heaven uh, with Jesus, that's what we'll be doing. We'll be letting our light so shine, we will continue praying, and we will continue studying. Isn't that interesting? I mean, that, if that's what it means to be a priest, then... So there's more explanation coming with that, and, and I don't want to jump ahead and add confusion to the story, but what have you heard all your life about Jesus' second coming? When he comes back, what's he riding? A white horse. Who is with him? Oh, you're right. I mean, the rapture. In the rapture, he comes with a cloud. And the dead in Christ shall rise first. Their bodies will meet their souls in heaven. And then we who are alive and remain will be caught up together with them in the clouds and be forever with the Lord. That's what the scripture says about the rapture. Then the second coming, he comes on a white horse. And who is with him? Do y'all know who's with him? The saints and his holy ones. Us. That's us. So we've been in heaven for seven years, and then we're going to come back with Jesus. Uh, the second coming is different than the rapture. There's a lot of differences, and we'll, we'll examine that when we get to chapter 4. But when we come back with Jesus, that's when he sets up the thousand-year reign. That's when we are a kingdom and priest unto God. We're coming back to a, a new, it's not the final new earth. It's a restored earth. And for a thousand years, Jesus will reign. And we will be kings and priests unto God during that thousand years. There's a lot more to the end of the story. You don't just die and go to heaven and that's it. <laughs> nope. There's a whole lot more. Boy, was I mad the first time I found that out. <laughs> what? I've been in church all my life. Nobody ever told me that. Yeah. And you hear funeral after funeral after funeral preaching that Revelation 22. And it's like, oh, brother, there's a lot more stuff that's going to happen before every tear is wiped away. Okay, so let's get back to now we know what it means to be a kingdom of priests. Then in verse 7, behold, he is coming with the clouds. There you go. Uh, he is coming with the clouds. And every eye will see him, even those who pierced him. Who pierced him? The Romans pierced him. So even the Romans are going to see him. Uh, even the Jews who turned him over yeah. to the Romans. 
um, here's there. And all of the tribes of the earth will mourn over him. So it is to be. Amen. When he comes in the clouds, uh, this is a reference to the second coming. Every eye will see him. In the rapture, every eye does not see him. In a twinkling of an eye, we're gone. It's the great disappearance. That our clothes will be left. It's just like the Left Behind movie, if you've ever seen that. That was really cool. Our, the clothes will just be gone in a twinkling of an eye. We're gone. Airplanes fall. Surgeons disappear from operating rooms. Uh, houses burn down because moms disappear from, or whoever's cooking. <laughs> Uh, the chef, you know, disappears from the stove. Yeah. So it will be a catastrophic event. The rapture will be very catastrophic. But in a twinkling of an eye, we're gone. Nobody sees Jesus. We hear a trumpet sound. And then in a twinkling eye, we're raptured, we're caught up. So the second coming, he comes with the clouds. And you're going to see the word cloud used a lot. It could be a literal cloud, but it's also a symbolic cloud. When you see cloud, think of witnesses, a cloud of witnesses. That means when he comes back with a cloud, he's coming back with a whole bunch of people that are witnesses, a whole bunch of witnesses. And we get that from Hebrews 11. You know, there's a cloud of witnesses that went before us. And all the patriarchs of our faith are listed in uh, the book of Hebrews in chapter 11. So that's a symbol to pay attention to. When you see cloud, think a group of people. Um, there's also, well, we'll get to that when we, when we run across it. I don't want to get too far ahead. Um, I am the Alpha and Omega. That's the first and letter, last letter of the Greek alphabet. Says the Lord God. So... The, the term Lord God, if you were in our summer Bible study, you were not, might remember that the word, the way that it's printed here, capital L, little O-R-D, is translated Adonai, and that means master. And then God is translated Elohim, and that represents the creator or the trinity. So we see master, creator. Lord God is the master trinity in that verse. Um, who is and who was and who is to come, the Almighty. Does there, anybody remember the name of God that means the Almighty? Uh, same as the all-sufficient one. Shaddai. El Shaddai. It's the Almighty. I, John, your brother and fellow partaker in the tribulation and kingdom and perseverance which are in Jesus, was on the island called Patmos because of the word of God and the testimony of Jesus. Now when um, he says he was he was a fellow partaker in the tribulation, remember that all of the disciples went through great tribulation and persecution after Jesus died and they were all crucified um, in the same way that Jesus was. They were all crucified for the testimony of Jesus because of their perseverance, because they held on to the gospel, there was a lot of tribulation. And the book of James tells us, count it all joy when you encounter various trials because that tests your faith, that, that increases perseverance or produces perseverance. And Jesus said, the world hated me, they're gonna hate you if you follow me, but in this world are, uh, is tribulation. So we know that as believers, we're going to have tribulation. Jesus promised it. Um, he was a part of the kingdom. He was a part of the perseverance, which are in Jesus. And he was on the island of Patmos. Now, the island of Patmos let's see if I can I'm going to zoom out to a bigger map. And I don't know if you can see that very well, but most of you know from just looking in your Bible where the Mediterranean Sea is. And that red area is called Asia Minor. And that's where the seven churches were. Patmos is off of that little red area. Of, it's off the coast of Asia Minor. And in real life today, 
it looks like that from a distance. That's the undeveloped side. The developed side, you can see the city down around the water. I thought it was interesting because the map looks like a seahorse. Do you see that? Like, I don't know the significance of that is, but I think it's cool. It was almost like Pegasus or a, or a seahorse or something. But that's what Patmos looks like. And the reason, uh, what Patmos served as was like our Alcatraz. It's where criminals were sent and they couldn't escape. There was no way to escape. It was just far enough off the coast. There was no swimming back to um, shore. It is a tourist attraction now. I don't have any of you ever been there and seen it. There is a cave called the Cave of John and the Catholic Church has, um, they, they oversee it. And so there's a lot of um, Catholic memorabilia and, and things like that inside. But there's some writing on the cave walls and, and that's why they think this is actually the Cave of John because there's drawings. Guess there's markings on the wall. That's why we mark in our Bible. Uh, yeah, because John did it. John did it first. Okay, so he was there because of the testimony, because of the word of God and the testimony of Jesus. They tried to shut him up. He would not shut up. And so he was arrested and sent to the island of Patmos where he lived out his days. And he was about 80 years old at this time. Now, verse 10 says, I was in the Spirit on the Lord's day. What does it mean to be in the Spirit? The best way, when I think back to the first time I really experienced um, being in the Spirit, I lost all track of time. I was, the, the presence of God was so real. And I could, I was at a worship conference and it was all a room full of worship leaders. We were we were all worship leaders back, you know, at home. And this was my first experience in this non-denominational modern worship atmosphere. And I was sitting on the third row and incredible worship musicians. The presence of God was so real. <laughs> Okay, so the presence of God was so real that I was no longer singing. I was uh, praying. I was standing with my hands open like this. My eyes were closed. And I began to have this vision that I was in the throne room of God. It was just bright. And I felt a heaviness, I mean, a, a reverence and an awe where all I could do was holy, 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 the Lord God Almighty. And I just was basking there. I was silent. And I remember kind of snapping out of it. Something changed in the room and I kind of snapped out of it and I looked around and I was so embarrassed because I didn't know. It was like an out-of-body experience. I had no idea how much time had passed. I didn't know if we had been there for two hours or three minutes. I I had no concept of time because I was so focused on God and it was such a holy moment, a holy intimate moment that I was completely unaware of anything that was going on around me. And that was my first experience. And then, you know, you begin, if you have an experience like that once, you long for it on a daily basis. And so anytime there's, you spend, you know, a, a longer time in worship sometimes. I mean, sometimes immediately you can just be in the presence of God, especially, yeah. But 
I don't know if any of you, I'm sure you have experienced the presence of the Holy Spirit. That's what it means to be in the Spirit. When you lose track of time, you lose track of what's going on around you, and you're so focused. That's what it means to be in the Spirit. And John was in the Spirit when? On the Lord's Day. In your research, in your homework, did you find what the Lord's Day was? Or when the Lord's Day was? Was that a question? Did you not have to answer that? So Acts 27, uh, Acts chapter 20, verse 7. Let's all turn there. talking to them, intending to leave the next day, and he prolonged his message until midnight. This was when they all gathered together to break bread. This was when they had their church after after Jesus was gone. They met on the first day of the week. Why would they meet on the first day of the week? That was the day that Jesus was resurrected. So as a memorial of resurrection day, that's why we have church on Sundays instead of Saturday. Saturday is the Sabbath. That's the Sabbath day. He says on the Lord's day. So is the Lord's day a Sabbath day? Or is it resurrection day? Uh, theologians have thought over this for generations. Um, there's whole denominations based on we meet on Saturdays. We don't meet on Sundays. We honor the Sabbath. The uh, All Jews, synagogues, the Sabbath is on Saturday. It begins Friday evening and goes, it, it begins at dusk and goes to the next day, dusk. So Sabbath is from Friday evening to Saturday evening. Jesus was resurrected on the first day of the week, Sunday, the Lord's Day. So in this, in this instance, why can't it mean both? That's my interpretation of it. And the reason I say that is because who is chapter 1 written to? Verse, verse 1, what does it say? He gave the message to John to give to the bond servants. And the bond servants are us. And we meet on Sunday. The Lord's day to us is Sunday. But the whole book of Revelation is for the Jews because God's not finished with the Jews yet. And the book of Revelation tells his plan for regathering Israel to himself. And so when they read this, what is the Lord's day for them? The Sabbath day. So I really believe it's both. I think it's they on purpose so that whoever the reader is can identify that it was John's worship day. Whether he was worshiping on Saturday or worshiping on Sunday, it was the day he had designated um, to meet with God. And on the Lord's day, he was in the spirit. So he was having an encounter with a holy, holy God. And while he was in the spirit, he had this vision. And this vision, uh, he said, he, I, I heard behind me a loud voice like the sound of a trumpet. Now, when he heard the, the trumpet, he didn't turn around yet. I don't know if you caught that or not, but the voice behind him that sounded like a trumpet. I don't know what kind of trumpet this was. When we think of a trumpet, we think of, like, you know, the trumpet of the band that's so loud, like a bugle, and it's loud and annoying sometimes when it's by itself because it is loud. But if you think of a shofar, being blown. It was a trumpet sound. It was a loud noise. It was an attention getting noise. So it got his attention and the voice said, write in a book what you see 
and send it to the seven churches. And then he names the seven churches, Ephesus, Smyrna, Pergamum, Thyatira, Sardis, and Philadelphia, and to Laodicea. Now these seven churches were not the only seven churches in those days. But the letters that John was supposed to send was to these specific churches. And that's what you'll, you'll learn about this next week. Then I turned. So after he heard the message, then he turned to see the voice that was speaking with me. And having turned, what did he see? Seven golden lampstands. And in the middle of the lampstands, I saw one like a son of man, clothed in a robe, reaching to his feet, and girded across his chest with a golden sash. His head and his hair were white, like white wool. Now, when I think of white wool, I think of a sheep, and it's kind of a dirty white. Yeah. Yeah. But then he clarifies and says, like white snow, like snow. And we go, oh, it's pure, pure wool right so he's dressed in white he's got a gold sash across his chest um, his hair is white and that's not the way we see jesus right now is it in our mind on the chosen he's got dark <laughs> hair dark skin dark hair right yeah um when in his glorified state he's got white hair he's all white and then um his eyes were like a flame of fire. Now, when you drew your picture, some of you may have given him red eyes because fire is red, or you may have given him orange eyes. Anybody else do something different? Those of us in your last class, perhaps. So there's a picture of a flame. What color is the flame on the candle? It's white. It's white with a little bit of yellow aura. Um, these flames here are uh, pictures of a Bunsen burner at different temperatures. And at the hottest temperature, it's blue, right? Here's my science person. So the hottest temperature is blue. So you could, you know, if possible, you may devise blue like a blue flame of fire but if his eyes are the color of fire red would be a little bit scary wouldn't it mm -hmm. i mean it, you just always associate red with evil i do you know uh, that looks like halloween to me uh, halloween creatures and i don't think that's the eyes that are being described here i think because his hair is white and his robe is white and he's got a gold, I think that it's like the white flame. I think it's a bright white flame because we even see that his feet were like burnished bronze when it had been made to glow in the furnace. So his feet are glowing. Um, his eyes are glowing and his feet are glowing. Um, and his voice was like the sound of many waters. Imagine that. What does this voice sound like? When you think of the waves rolling at the beach, the roar of the waves, or if you've been to Niagara Falls and you hear the power of any waterfall coming off a mountain. I looked up an audio of Niagara Falls. It's really loud. It's really yes, loud. Yes. I stood there and it is yes. tremendously loud. Um, but it's not a it's <coughs> powerful, it's not a fearful thing, it's a soothing. It's very calm. Don't you love to be at the beach and just listen to the waves? Uh, the sound of many waters, a river flowing, a river, the waters rushing over a river uh, is a calming, soothing voice. In his right hand, now this is significant, and we're going to see this over and over and over in Revelation. The right hand means the hand of authority. The right hand always means authority. That's why we raise our right hand in a court of law. To swear to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. In his right hand, he had held seven stars. Out of his mouth came a sharp, two-edged sword. What did you learn about the sword? What is the sword? Thank <laughs> you. 
the word of God. The word of God is living and active and sharper than two uh, any two-edged sword. So the, the two-edged sword, the first time I took this class and I drew my um, picture, I had a literal sword coming up out of his mouth because I didn't know. But as you begin to look at all the cross-references to the sword, you know, when you put on the full armor of God, uh, the sword of the spirit is, is one of the things. Um, but it's the word of God. He, he speaks the word of God. His face was like the sun shining in its strength. So his face is shining as well. It's glowing. His eyes are glowing. His hair is glowing. His face is glowing. His feet are glowing. And then he's got in his right hand these seven stars. And he's in the midst of seven lampstands. Remember when in Matthew 17, 2 is the Mount of Transfiguration. Do you remember when uh, let's just turn there real quick. Matthew 17, 2. Because this is very consistent. Six days later, Jesus, uh, in verse 1, six days later, Jesus took with him Peter, James, and John, his brother, and led them up on a high mountain by themselves. And he was transfigured before them, and his face shone like the sun, and his garment became as white as light. So we see a foreshadowing of um, what he looks like in Revelation 1. This is consistent. The image is consistent. When I saw him, I fell at his feet like a dead man. Now, how did the one, this one, like the son of man, respond? He placed his which hand? Right hand on me. That means he had the authority. And he placed his right hand on John. And he said, do not be afraid. I am the first and the last. There are uh, times in, in Revelation where John encounters someone that looks like a son of man. And he falls down to worship him. And he's not allowed to worship. He said, don't do that. I'm a fellow servant of yours. I'm a fellow brother of yours. Um, meaning he was in the presence of an angel. We know this is Jesus because Jesus allows himself to be worshipped. The only other uh, angel in scripture that was that allowed himself to be worshipped was Satan. And he got in a lot of trouble for that. So um, angels are not to be worshipped. Only Jesus is to be worshipped. When when Satan tempted Jesus in the wilderness, uh, Jesus rebuked him and said, worship God only. So he said, I am the first and the last and the living one. So this is his identity. I was dead and behold, I am alive forevermore. So he's identifying himself as the resurrected one. And I have the keys of death and Hades. And we've already talked about that. He has the keys. Now, I'm a realtor um, in my day job. And if you've ever bought a house, you know that when you go to closing, you get the title the, to the house and you get the key. But if you don't go to the house and take possession or move in or make sure it's empty and do that final walkthrough, um, you may own the house, you may own the title deed, and you may have the keys, but you have to move in to take possession. And we're going to see when we get to chapter 5, Jesus, at his resurrection, when he went down to Hades and emptied out Abraham's bosom, he had the keys to death, he overcame death in the grave, he overcame Hades, he has the key, but he hasn't moved he has a title deed to earth as well. He conquered. And he's he's king of kings, lord of lords, and he reigns forevermore. But he hasn't taken possession yet because who is still in control of the earth? Satan. He still is prowling about like a lion seeking whom he may devour. And But there's coming a day when Jesus is going to stand up from the throne, from the right hand, the side of the authority of the majesty on high and he is going to take possession of the earth 
and Satan is going to be bound for a thousand years. That day is coming. So he's got the keys, he's got the title deed, but he hasn't taken possession yet. But it gets exciting when we get to that chapter in Revelation and you see him stand up. Oh, he's, here it comes. Here it comes. Okay, so he's, uh, now he says, Therefore, write the things which you have seen and the things which are and the things which will take place after these things. That's the outline of the whole book of Revelation. The things which he has seen is this vision in chapter 1. That's what John has seen, and he was supposed to write those things down. So we've covered the first division of the book of Revelation. Then we're going to go into the things which are. He's supposed to write the things which are. The things which are is the church age. We're not through with the church age. And we see the, the letters to the seven churches in chapters two and three. And then chapter four begins the things that will take place after these things. The things that must take place. No, this says the things which will take place after these things. As for the mystery of the seven stars, I love this because uh, John will do this consistently throughout Revelation. He'll tell us, he'll give us the interpretation of the symbols that are in the scripture. And he says, as for the mystery of the seven stars which you saw in my right hand, and the seven golden lampstands, the seven stars are the angels of the seven churches. So the stars are angels. Remember that. There's stars that are going to fall from heaven in the book of Revelation. Um, we know there are fallen angels. So remember that symbolism. I also find it encouraging um, in the book of Daniel, uh, Gabriel, uh, my, no, it was Michael the Prince, Michael, one of the angels, the archangels, uh, was sent to minister to Daniel but he got uh, he got delayed because of warfare with the king of tears of Tyre which was a fallen angel so he was deterred by warfare and he got in a, a, you know, a battle and so he was late getting to Daniel to uh, minister to Daniel so we see that stars are angels so Daniel had a uh, he said the, the king of Tyre, they're regional. Angels, there are angels. There's all different levels of angels. And we have archangels and we have, and then we have spirits and dominions and forces of darkness. You know, there's uh, good angels and bad angels, but within the angelic realm, there's a hierarchy. It's just like our earthly armies. You know, there's army, navy, marines, there's admirals and captains and lieutenants and privates and sergeants and you know there's a whole hierarchy of military and it's the same way in the angelic realm and what i love is this verse gives us a glimpse that every church has an angel overseeing it the hills west fort worth campus has an angel designated for our campus and there's one at keller and there's one at north richland hills and every single church you see on every corner, there's an angel assigned to that church. And I just love that idea. It's also that way about a city. There is an angel over an entire city. There are angels over nations and kings, the king of that nation. You know, there, imagine the warfare in Washington, D.C. I mean, just imagine the warfare. I just uh, the depth, the depth of, of corruption there, um, darkness, you know, of just in the angelic realm. We forget that there's an unseen world. We forget that sometimes. And I love that there is an angel uh, over the church. And the lampstands are the churches. The lampstands are the churches. Remember that because. You're, you're going to see that when you when we get to chapter 4. So, in summary, you can go to your last page. Verses 1 through 3 in chapter
chapter one, um, there was an introduction. Verses four through seven was a greeting. Chapter, uh, verse eight was a description of the authority of Jesus Christ. Nine through 19 is the vision of Jesus that John saw. And then verse 20 is the explanation. The obvious list, there's a description, um, and I, I broke these down. You were to do this in your workbook, and you can kind of check your work. I think it was the very last question. Um, you had to make a list of all the titles of Jesus, and then his appearance, and then what he does. And so I just gave you kind of an answer key, so you can check your work on that. Well, our time has come to a close. Uh, I wanted to address your drawings that you did at the beginning of class. If your picture looked like that, you're in good company with a sword coming out of his mouth. Um, I did a search online for uh, Revelation 1 image of Jesus Christ. And it was amazing. There were probably a hundred that came up and I kept scrolling and going, nope, that, that one's missing the keys. That one has the sword coming out of the mouth. You wouldn't believe how many had the literal sword coming out of the mouth. So this is one I found that looked pretty accurate. Um, he's dark skinned, but he has white hair. Um, the, the sash is in the right place because it's supposed to be over his chest. And he's among the seven lampstands. Those lampstands are not the correct lampstands. They're seven branch lampstands. And he has the seven stars in his hand, but in his left hand, he doesn't have the keys. I love to see a picture where the stars are in his right hand, and then he has the keys to death and Hades in his left hand. Um, but anyway, I would encourage you to finish that picture. And your picture may have changed when you started because maybe you drew the sword, literal sword coming out of his mouth, which is perfectly acceptable. The more literally you translate this, the more accurate you will be. But then we always need to go and look at the symbols, and the sword is a symbol of the Word of God. So now you can redraw it with this sword bubble or something, or the Bible, you know, near his mouth. Because the Word, he speaks the Word of God. Okay, our time is over. Um, Thank you for hanging with me today. We will go verse by verse through chapters two and three, but it would really be helpful if you did all of your homework. It will take you a little bit longer to do all of those. Um, if you want to stay, if you have questions and you want to stay for 10 or 15 more minutes, you're more than welcome to do so, and I'll stay as long as you need questions answered. Yes? So finish the drawing chapter two and chapter three each day and then also work in our workbooks 25 which is chapters two and three. Mm -hmm. It may take you more than one sitting to do your homework this week. Usually it's about an hour to do your homework, but this might take you two, just for a little bit of rest. Any other questions? Okay, thank y'all for coming today. Bless this week. <laughs> Would y'all turn your handouts over? Look on the back of your class handout. And if you have something that says you are blessed written on it, does anybody have that? You get a free pack of sticky notes because sticky notes are the best way to refine yourself and stuff in your life. And it's a workbook.